Good evening. Hey, Sue. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Okay. You look like you're all bundled up there. I can't get rid of this chill today. <laughs> since I was shoveling at 6 a.m. I haven't quite gotten warm. Ugh. We got about 10 inches here. What did you, did you guys get a lot down there? Zero. Really? <laughs> oh my gosh, I lost two of the trees in my yard. I'm so sad. That is sad. It's very sad. I just had planted it like eight years ago and it's just getting the perfect height. Sad. Oh, sure. We, we got about two and a half inches of totally saturated slush. Ah, and is it still, is it raining or doing anything now or is it gone? It's, it stopped, it was, it was sleeting for a while, freezing rain all day and then, and then um, yeah. my heart rate monitor told me that I burned 650 calories while I shoveled it. <laughs> yeah, slush will do that to you. <laughs> it really was very, very heavy. It took us a long time this morning. That's for certain. The, the trick is to not lift it. Try to just smush it off to the sides and say, right. I, did a, I did a lot of sliding. Yeah. That's shocking how different the snowfall was. You're in Newburyport and yeah, uh, we, the, the, the it, Natick, my brother in Natick had a foot and a half. It's just. Huh. Yeah, we yeah, got my, like. My stepson in Concord had a foot and a half, but it was, mm. it was light, fluffy snow. His, his snowball huh. just shot, shot it oh, away. Wow. No, yeah, we, we had really a solid bad. 18 or 19 inches here in Concord. Oh, you did, Mark? Yeah, wow. I had to have a guy with a bobcat come plow my driveway up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the truck was too high. The snow right. was too high for the rack of the truck. Wow. <laughs> well, there. I didn't have to go anywhere. My daughter turned 18 yesterday. We are home celebrating alone. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. But now she's out sliding. <laughs> Gary, it always looks so cozy at your house with that stove going in the background. Is that just a flat screen with an image on it, or is it an actual stone? <laughs> I think we all need uh, calmness and serenity. That's nice. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, it, it's very, it's very pleasant. It's, it, 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 I feel warmer just looking at it. I know. I'm gonna have to take <laughs> off my. I'm gonna have to take this off in a minute. Well, we have to talk. Explain, by the way, that I'm not, his, I have his empty bookshelf is in the background. <laughs> I haven't been brawling in bar rooms. I had a little minor <laughs> surgery on my cheek, which is the reason yeah. for this bandage. Well, I'm sorry you didn't get to ball in brawl in Mary Ellen, I'm gonna come up with another story. <laughs> <laughs> Muffin. Good idea, Muffin. <laughs> Muffin, I think you're muted. That's probably the safest thing for me, Alan. <laughs> um, you know my genes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do a little introduction. Alan Wilson is our town moderator, um, Mark, Mr. Bobrowski, that we need to have a conversation with eventually about the warrant and how we'll, how we'll handle any changes should they come before town meeting. Hello, Hello Mark. Nice to Hello. meet you. <laughs> we, we have uh, the thrill of uh, being the guinea pigs for the governor's new 50% majority rule. So. Exactly. Right. And I know your uh, moderator, Carmen Reese. She's a great person. Mm -hmm. I, haven't been to, I haven't been to Concord Town meeting in a while. It's a busman's holiday. Oh, well, you, um, then you, you probably were last. Carmen, I think, has only been the moderator for three or four years. So you probably yeah. have been there with uh, Ned. Ned. Oh, sure. Ned, Ned is an old friend. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we can get started. Um, I have 6.32, so um, uh, welcome to the February 2nd Planning Board Public Forum meeting regarding the recodification of our town zoning bylaws. 
this meeting is being recorded. Uh, I'd like to take a roll call now of the planning board members, uh, Mr. Coons. Ms. Delisio. Present. Ms. Foley. Present. Mr. Gilbert. Here. Mr. Olney. I'm here. And Mr. Russell. I'm here. We have a quorum present. I also notice online is a, a zoning a chair, Sarah Mellish and building inspector Paul Orlando. They were instrumental in helping us formulate uh, what we have today. So just a little uh, pre, uh, preamble here on March 26, 2019, the planning board began its effort to recodify and update the zoning bylaws. Recodification and updating of the bylaws was a recommendation of our 2019 master plan. The planning board engaged Mark Bobrowski, a, a partner in the firm of Blattman, Bobrowski and Haverty in Concord, Mass to assist the board in this endeavor. Mark has been practicing land law use for over 35 years. His mm -hmm. practice extends statewide and it focuses on assisting clients in the public and private sectors with permitting strategy, decision-making litigation and appellate arguments. He has worked in one capacity or another in half the state's communities, including the recodification ordinances of bylaws of at least hundred cities and towns in the Commonwealth. He's also recodified general bylaws, subdivision regulations and administrative regulations in do dozens of municipalities. The planning board, town planner Sue Brown, zoning board appeal chair Sarah Mellish and building inspector Paul Orlando have met in public meetings with Mark over 16 times in the past year and a half. During that period, the board has reorganized the bylaws, eliminated repetitive bylaws, eliminated illegal and outdated bylaws, consolidated bylaws, proposed moving certain bylaws into the general bylaws, redefined definitions and added new definition. This recodification and update initiative is an iterative process. Now that we have our initial changes memorialized, the planning board is holding this workshop to solicit input from you, the public. The planning board will review the information received tonight and decide whether additional revisions to the bylaws should be made. The planning board will then schedule and conduct a public hearing on the revised bylaws. The recommended changes to the bylaws will be presented on our annual ten town meeting requesting adaptation. Before I introduce Mark Wabrowski to go over the proposed changes the planning board is offered for consideration, I'd like to go over some, some uh, ground rules. As a reminder, the discussions and recommendations by the board for bylaw changes are just that, recommendations. No bylaw changes are taking place at this meeting. These are steps in aligning our laws in concert with our master plan. The documents that are being reviewed are available on the town's website. We have a lot of ground to cover, so please keep your questions and opinions focused on zoning changes presented. If we do not get through all the sections tonight, I will ask the board to schedule a second forum. Questions on structural and organizational changes will be kept to the end. It's expected that Mark will be able to answer most of the questions on the proposed changes. If a question requires an answer from someone else, I will ask a member of the board, the ZBA chair, the building inspector or town staff to answer. If a question cannot be answered, we will take note of the question and try to answer in meeting minutes and document it as such. Mark will start with the section number and go over the proposed changes. After each section is summarized, I will open the section up for questions and discussions. Please use the hand raise feature on the Zoom and I will call you on you in the order listed. I will attempt to get to all hands, all raised hands, all hand raised attendees. Please try to be brief. If you're on the phone, please ask the chair to be recognized. Time permitting, we'll get into a second round of questions at the end. If your question has previously been discussed, there's no reason to repeat it. And thanks for participating tonight. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our um, Mark Bobrowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see that there are 47 zoning aficionados in the town of Manchester by the sea. That's a, getting close to a record other than a town meeting. This is the workshop meeting. So what we've done now is going to be uh, vetted by the public. We're 
assiduously taking notes to be sure that good ideas don't go unnoticed and we will be meeting again as a committee to incorporate suggested changes if they carry the ball tonight. Uh, but I don't think we'll be, be, be making those decisions tonight. I think we'll reserve that for a later meeting when we have a chance to discuss these things. Um, as the chairman pointed out, uh, I've worked in places as small as, I just finished helping the folks in Mount Washington recodify their bylaw. That's the second smallest town in the state. Uh, the smallest being Gosnold, which has no people basically. And uh, except for the ones on Cuddyhunk. And I've done cities as big as Lowell, um, uh, New Bedford, Salem, Quincy. Uh, I'm doing Medford right now as well. So there's a lot of difference between communities. And I, I don't come to this with a fixed notion. I try to listen to the committee to see what they think is best for the community. And uh, what you have in front of you is draft eight of this process. You know, there were several drafts uh, presented in substance. And then there have been some small tweaks, I would say, between drafts four and eight. Uh, nothing hugely uh, significant has happened. But with each clean version, we give it a new number. So that's where we are right now. You'll also be interested to know that there is a coded version of this. I don't know what you're looking at if you're looking along at home. There are two versions, a clean version, which has no strike throughs uh, or color in it. And there's also a coded version, which shows every deletion that's been made and every addition that's been made um, and also shows retained text as uh, just normal black text. So if you have questions about where the changes have occurred, that'd be a good place to start. Is it online, Sue? I could share my screen with it if you'd like. Yeah, uh, yes, no, it is, it is online. Gonna, Both the okay. coded and the clean are online. I'm going to use the, the clean version. I, I sort of know where the bones are buried, so I'll tell you as we go through the process. So what I propose to do is take this section by section. There are 11 sections, definitions being the last. I'm sorry, there are 12 sections, definitions being the last. And what I would propose to do is uh, point out the changes that have occurred in the sections. Um, some are obviously more important than others. Um, if there are questions about any changes to a section, shout it out. Uh, we'll wait till the dusk clears and then move on to the next section. Mark, Mark so, are you going to share the screen that shows those or do we need to find it ourselves? Uh, I hadn't planned on showing it. Uh, we hadn't discussed that, Sue and Ron. Uh, perhaps uh, if you have a, a coded version, perhaps we can put that up on the screen. Ron, Ron does have that. Ron, do you want to share that? Thank you. There'll be a lot of scrolling because there's a lot of pages and <laughs> a lot will be strikeouts, but um, yeah, we'll be we'll, right. You'll see the process. You'll see the process that was gone through. Do you, do you okay. think it's helpful to have that up or, or not? No, I do. Um, it'll, it'll, I think it'll convince most of you that what happens in a recodification is that somewhere between 70 and 80% of the text is old text and it's not uh, changed in, in many ways. For example, section 1.1 purpose. On, I mean, excuse me, is this being shared? Can yes. you see this? Okay. If, Ron, if you'll just listen to my... Uh, Okay. My comments, you can scroll accordingly. So section 1.1 purpose contains your old purpose clause. Ron, you can scroll down to page two. So we didn't change a thing there. And these new sections are just basically better wordsmithing than your old sections. They contain the authority for the bylaw, the scope of the bylaw, the applicability, which focuses principally upon uh, this bylaw versus other general bylaws that you may have in town and how to construe which bylaw controls um, amendments, which are governed by statute, chapter 48, section five. There are a couple of provisions in here for changes of district boundaries and costs. If somebody on the private side is proposing a zoning amendment, you might want to uh, spread the costs around by asking them to uh, contribute. Uh, if you go down again around these, I'm sorry, the provision, there's one missing provision here in the coded version and I added it into the clean version and it's the all important severability clause uh, which just got lost somewhere in the shuffle. Uh, that says that if there's a, a challenge to a section of the bylaw that's successful, the rest of the bylaw stands on its own merits. So 
So this is more or less what I term the handshake of the bylaw. I, it, it just contains some basic introductory provisions and sets up some general rules going forward. Hearing no questions, I'm gonna move on to section two, which is districts. Uh, we did create one new district, the D district, residence D was divided into two, district one and district two, RD1, RD2. And the only difference between them is the treatment of certain multifamily structures uh, based upon location within the district. Uh, and so you'll see in the use table, uh, in, you'll see SRA, SRB, SRC, RD1, RD2, SRE, GD, and limited commercial LCD. If you could scroll down a bit more, most of this district stayed pretty much the same. I do think that we're looking to get a new map together. Go back up a little bit more, Ron. Up, not down, there you go. Uh, the map information is changed. We found a, a more up-to-date map to reference. And then there are a couple of provisions at the very end on split lots. Split lots are lots that are divided by either a town boundary and the rule there that we've adopted, this new rule, very common in most towns is that if a lot is half in Manchester by the sea and half in another, the provisions of this bylaw by -law will be applied to the portion of such lot in the town as the same manner as if the entire lot is in the town. And if it's split by the district boundary, uh, there is a carryover rule here that allows the rules from the less restricted district to extend into the more restrict restricted district uh, by 30 feet, but it will not apply in RD2. And again, that's a common rule where somebody has a lot split by a district boundary. Sometimes that's by special permit and it is here. Questions on section two. Uh, I, I think Sandy has a question. Sandy, can you unmute? Hi, thank you. Sandy Rogers, 82 Old Essex Road. Um, do you have a map to show of the, the districts so that we have an understanding of any changes that you're making to each of the districts? Um, if you, the map is referenced, if you'll go backwards, Ron. The map is referenced here. Keep going one more page. And I believe it's an existing map a little bit more, Ron. That's good, stop right there. So this is the map for, prepared by Horsley Witten in April of 2004, I'm sorry. And that um, is resident in town hall now with the exception of an amendment that needs to be made for the, R, uh, the RD1, RD2 change. Mark, so there I would was just... a district D and you've split it into two. Which district is that? It was the old residence D district, and now it's residence uh, D, RD1 and RD2. Okay, so. So are hang, you... on, hang on a second. I'll, I'll give you a better explanation if you give me a chance to look at the old bylaw. Ron, could I clarify something? This is Sue. Yes, Sue, go ahead. I. Um... Yeah. I just want I people to, to know we're not changing any district boundaries. We're just labeling them differently. Well, with the exception of the RD1, RD2, which, which right. is now going to have a slight, it's not a big change. It's a pretty small change. So the old bylaw says within that portion of RD uh, included within a line running 100 feet from and parallel to the easterly and westerly sidelines of Pine Street, northerly and southerly southerly sidelines of Pleasant Street, the westerly side of School Street, the north of Pleasant Street extension, the east of Arbella Street, and the northerly sidelines of Lincoln, um, which are apparently designated as uh, an art in Article 21 of 1985's town meeting. The conversion of a single family to a two family are permitted if authorized by special permit. So that's the thing that we've essentially uh, put into its own district at this point. It it, it's unusual to have this um, carve out by streets without creating a, a district or a sub-district without formally designating it with a name. Um, and so that's essentially what we've done here. 
And it only applies to the streets that I've referenced. And if you wanna see that in the existing bylaw, which you can easily Google, it's old section 4.2.3. Okay, I was trying to... Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, most importantly, with regard to the, the old districts, uh, we did not change dimensional uh, numbers, frontage, area, uh, lot coverage, building height, all of those remain the same. Use regulations, uh, you see a little bit of yellow here, and that's good news because your old bylaw does not have a use table. It has a narrative approach, and in fact, it has a pyramid narrative approach in which one district piggybacks on the rules of another uh, district already mentioned. And it's a lot easier if you have a use table because it allows you to just at a glance, see what's allowed in a district versus what's prohibited. So this beginning part here basically just sets up the structure of the use table and uh, gives you a key. Uh, if the special permit granting authority is the zoning board of appeals, it's a ZBA in the use table. PB for planning board, SB for select board. You can go down the road. Um, we also put in the use table, the parking regulations. So it's a, another handy way to uh, figure out what the use requires by way of mandatory parking. And then there's some sections on accessory uses here. First, those that are permitted in all districts that includes, so go back, slide down, slide back up. Thank you. That includes accessory scientific uses. This is mentioned in the statute in chapter 40A section nine. You didn't have that before, but since it's mentioned in the statute, we put it in. Family daycare homes are also mentioned in the statute. There's a default position for family daycare homes, which is that if you don't regulate them, they're allowed everywhere. I prefer a better default position, which is small is allowed as, as of right, and large is allowed by special permit. The difference is six non-residents, I'm sorry, six children in a small, including resident participants, 10 children in a large, including resident participants. These are not to be confused with the big child care centers that the companies uh, national in nature run, like kinder care or primrose, uh, which have upwards of 150 kids most of the time. These are accessory, usually done on, virtually always done out of a residential home. And the thinking is that if 10 kids are going to be yelling in your side yard, you might want a public hearing uh, to at least voice opinions about proper acoustical mitigation. Uh, Non-residential accessory uses, uh, exactly what it says. If the use is allowed as of right, then it's also allowed by, uh, by uh, special permit. And then residential accessory uses, you can see uh, borders are already mentioned in your bylaw. Contractor's yard. Uh, commercial landscaping, uh, we have allowed either on a larger parcel uh, or on a smaller parcel by special permit. Overnight parking of commercial vehicles, uh, we discussed at length one commercial vehicle less than 14,000 GVW is allowed as of right, and that's in the driveway. That would not be garaged on the premises. Home occupations, uh, we added a few home occupations that were not mentioned just because your old bylaw was in fact old. And those are people that also make their living out of the house. Swimming pools was the subject of much discussion. And we, we uh, came up with something that we think is simpler, largely uh, through Sarah's help because she deals with it all the time on the ZBA. And then under prohibited accessory uses, we're just clarifying that kennels, auto repair out of the house and storage of, uh, recreational vehicles, boats, and trailers in a required side yard or rear setback area is not allowed. Doesn't mean you can't put it in your backyard. You just can't stick it right up against the fence or in the side yard right up against somebody's kitchen window. I have a question about that. Uh, Jeff Delaney, 10 Ancient County Way. Many of the uh, smaller um, lots and areas A, B, and RD1 and RD2 their only side yard is their driveway, which is against the lot line. So taking away the ability to put trailers or recreational vehicles is going to cut them out. Somebody with a utility trailer they use for um, going to the compost, 
or going to the transfer station or maybe a small skiff they use during the summer. I mean, that's going to be a problem for these people. Can you talk to that, please? Well, duly noted, I, for years I kept a Montauk in my side yard and I had a nice neighbor so they never complained here in Concord. But uh, I'll, I'm going to make a note of that and I'm going to talk about that with the planning board. Perhaps they would want to add some provision that says you could be closer or in the required yard by special permit, which is- Well, really my, my only thing is that these vehicles have, you know, wheels on them or a trailer. I mean, they're not really uh, conforming or, I mean, a uh, temporary structure or a permanent structure. So why would they be governed by setbacks? Because zoning controls use of land and the setback is the use of land. So, I mean, we all know, no, no, nobody in present company, but we all know people who have stored their boat in their side yard for the better part of the last 30 years and it hasn't moved. So that's the, the thing you're trying to prevent here. Same probably would be true of recreational vehicles, lesser with regard to trailers. But the, it's, at some point, zoning anticipates bad behavior and tries to prepare for it accordingly. Not that it'll always happen, but you don't write rules about the good stuff. You write rules to prevent the bad stuff. I understand that. I think it. I think it just really cuts out a lot of people with smaller properties in that area. But uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd look into it a little further. Thank you. I've made. I've made a note, and we'll put it on the agenda for the next planning board meeting. Thank you. You bet. If there are no other questions about section three, we can come back to the use table um, at a later point. If once we get through the main bylaw. You can put it up, Mark, if you want. Why don't you put it up now, Ron? Let's, let's get it out of the way. Let me know if you can see it. I can. Yep, it works perfectly. So now we're, uh... I hope that that was met at home with muted oohs and ahs, because that is your first use table as a town. And you can see what I was talking about before. All of a sudden I can see that, for example, there's a difference between RD1 and RD2, whereas two family dwellings are allowed as of right in RD1, they're allowed by Board of Appeals special permit in RD2, same for conversion to a two family. And I believe that those are the only differences between RD1 and RD2, those two line items. But the order of things here is residential and then community facilities. Um, what you see is yellow for new wording and strikeouts for old wording. For example, on uh, church B1, church and related use, the statute actually says use of land or structure for religious purposes. Same thing with educational use not conducted for profit. The statute actually says use of land or structures for educational purposes, blah, blah, blah. Child care, school age, um, child care program are equally exempt. Those are your so-called Dover uses right there, B1, B2, and B3. Uh, and then there's municipal uses, which we had a long discussion about because there weren't many exemptions for municipal uh, uses. And then uh, as you work your way down, uh, these are old uses that are still uh, codified as in the existing bylaw. Essential services is basically something like a public utility. It's quasi-monopolistic and um, the, the, uh, the statute calls out what are called public service corporations to, to qualify for this. And that's allowed by special permit in any district. Note that the Dover uses are all allowed as of right in every district. There's Y's across the board in B1, B2, B3. That's state law. And then agricultural uses are spelled out a little bit better than they are today. There's some exempt uses uh, for agriculture, be it five acres or two qualified acres, you can't say no. Under commercial, um, we, I think we probably need to fill in the adult entertainment uses. I believe it was going to be LC, but that's a missing thing in the coded version. Uh, the rest of them look pretty, um, pretty concise. So you can see business offices, medical offices, medical office building, general retail, 
uh, service establishments, restaurants, fast food, and motor vehicle uses uh, after that. Recreational uses, including clubs and facilities, whether operated for or not for profit, wireless telecommunication, a vet office, some boat related issues that are existing, some energy related issues that are existing, uh, marijuana businesses is uh, now regulated, and drive through. Um, requires a special permit as a standalone use of land. So whether it's at a CVS or a, an ice cream stand or a bank, it's going to be something if it's in the qualifying G or LC districts, it's going to require a special permit. And then accessory uses are spelled out there um, in the bottom. You've already seen those in the text, but each of those is also repeated in the chart. And then lastly, I think you had, well, I think we crossed off the only one other thing you had there. Yeah, I think we did. So <clears throat> that's the draft of the use table. Okay, any questions? Uh, uh, Mary. Hi, Ron, thanks. Yeah, Mary Foley. Um, Mark, I just wanted to make sure that we were listing in the commercial section, all of the potential uses that could happen in the limited commercial district. I don't see things like hotel and other things that have been discussed, assisted living as a commercial use. And then there are still areas um, that are left blank under residential. There's mixed use, but there's nothing filled in, as you said, adult entertainment and also outdoor recreational club, that line is blank. So I wanted to make sure one that we added all those limited commercial district potential commercial uses along with those other items. Thank That's you. That's a good point because that was kind of an ongoing uh, topic. We had some people visit with ideas from, uh, rep, you know, not necessarily representing the LC district, but just with good ideas about the LC district. So we should make sure that we've uh, caught all of that in the final draft of the use table. Okay, thank you. Um, Sandy, is that a leftover hand raise or is that a second hand raise? Oh, leftover. Okay, um, do you want to go back to section four, Mark? Sure. Hi, I, I would, that, uh, I'm it, sorry, I couldn't, I was unmuting myself. Um, is there a key to this table? It's back, it's back in the text. As I pointed out, it's under section three point. Um, Hang on a second, it's three point, um, one point two. Three point one point two. there's a key. So Ron, you'll go back to the table. Keep going back a little more. There you go, right there. See right in the, right in the middle of the page, there's your key. And the districts are also abbreviated in section two. So you can uh, see those in the, in the list of districts at the beginning of section two. And so N means it, no. you know, it, no, you don't it means need prohibited. any type of approval and. No, it I, means, I, no, it means the use is prohibited. Okay. okay. So a Y would be the use is permitted without any kind of a special permit. The N would be the use is not allowed and uh, ZBA or PB or SB means that it's a special permit. And that would be the notation of the special permit granting authority. And those are the three boards in a town that qualify for the job. Right. It's right. always as designated though. You cannot forum shop. Okay. Cause I mean, you know, just, just sort of skimming and, and just scrolling through, um, it's very di a, a bit difficult to follow. Um, and this is the first time there's these permitted uses, but some of these were obviously in, in existence and some are new. Um, so it, it looks like if it's yellow, then this is all new, correct? Yellow is new, right. So there's a lot of new wording changes to, for citizens to review on their own. Well, if you go back to the table, Ron. Right? 
I mean, for example, senior housing is new. Mixed use hasn't had a constituency yet, but it's staying in the in the coded table for now. Um, it may make it in the LCD district, but we're, we're not there yet. Uh, then in the first three that you see on the next page, those are all allowed today, but you didn't call them the right thing as far as I'm concerned, because the statute is quite specific as to what it means. Um, it's Those are the religious, educational, and child care exemptions created by Section 3. In 4 and 5, you had reference to municipal uses, uh, but I think all you said was parks, playgrounds, recreational uses, wells, water storage, processing, sewage lift stations, and related building and parking facilities. But what about a senior center or an office or a fire and police station? So we added those. And then as you move your way into the agricultural realm, you had greenhouses, but you didn't take uh, any account for the statute, which says in number one, for example, that if I've got five acres or two qualified acres, I have a right, that's why it's all yeses across the board, I have a right to conduct agriculture on my property. And then the question becomes number three, for example, if I don't have five acres or two qualified acres, do you want me raising pigs? No, we want you to have uh, agriculture, horticulture or floriculture. And um, some, some of those other things are prohibited, the raising and keeping of livestock. Um, and then, you know, as we move through the rest of it, um, I think you had service establishment, but not personal or general. We just provided a definition for each of those. A fast food restaurant was not considered before as a separate issue. Uh, motor vehicles have mostly been retitled. Uh, it used to say automotive repair. Now it just says motor vehicle instead. Um, outdoor, indoor recreational club, vet, office, or clinic. You know, I always say, do you have a vet? Well, maybe you should account for him or her. Um, keep going, Ron. Um, there's the 14,000 GBW that we added. And there's um, the scientific uses in Chapter 40A, Section 9, the family daycare home in Chapter 40A, Section 3. Uh, people have electric vehicles, so it's a good thing to plan for that. Adult social daycare um, is like a family daycare, except it serves adults rather than children. People uh, who can't afford, for example, assisted living for a parent or a loved one might drop them off at an assisted living facility during the day and pick them up in the evening when they're going home from work. Or a van might take them to an assisted living facility during the day. So it's an accessory use. It's not the principal use. Most of it stays the same but there are some new uses. Excuse, can I ask a question about the 14,000 GVW rule? Yeah. yeah. Um, someone with a truck and trailer, a landscaper say, for instance, would that be combined or would those two be figured separately? Because, you know, you could have a 10,000 pound truck plus a trailer would put you over the 14,000. Well, I think the way we wrote it, it would just focus on the vehicle, not the trailer. And the, and the thing we were trying to promote is that okay. you can bring one home, but when you start bringing two home, it gets a little bit non-residential. Of course, if you're going to put it in a garage. Right. But my question was only if you were combining the truck and the trailer, because a lot of times a landscaper will leave his truck hooked to a trailer. You know? The way we wrote it just focuses on the truck. Um, okay, I, thank you. Uh, I see Laura Tenney has her hand raised. Uh, Laura, would you? Yes, hi, thanks, Ron. Uh, Laura hi. from Pine Street, 86 Pine Street. I have a question about D1 and D2, since we don't yet have a new map that we can point to. Can you describe which is which geographically and why the differences in the use table uh, well, looks like I, I, I uh, did, family I did take... by right in one and not by right in another? Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I did take the time to read the provisions of the old or bylaw, which talks about in the RD, in the D district, the land which is 100 feet from and parallel to the following streets, Pine, Pleasant, School, Pleasant Street Extension, Arabella Road, Arabella, Arabella Street, Lincoln Street, 
Um, and I think that's it. That's special permit. So that would be RD2, I believe, looking at the table. And RD1 would be other units, other, other um, every, every place else in RD, the old RD. And that's a little hard to visualize without map. having the map, the new well, map. If, if you want to go in your existing bylaw, which is online, and look at section 4.2.3, there's a section entitled applicability. And there's also a map that is, that is attached to that. And that map is in. Um, I am looking at the, at the current zoning map. Well, no, there's a special map. If you look yeah, at the okay. back of the book, it says, if you can see, C maps, it says 4.2.3 C maps. Okay. In, okay. in the old bylaw. Online quite as quickly, but. <laughs> All right. And then if you go to the back of the uh, old zoning, not the new zoning, the old zoning, it has a new district D as defined 4.2.3. And I believe that it carves out those streets for you to. So basically what was previously known as the D district is what we think of as the village. And why do we treat it differently with regards to as of right use for two family or for a single family? I'm just wondering. Well, because the D regulations, yeah. actually, the, the D existing D regulate, we didn't change this. The existing D regulations do call this out in 4.2.3. And rather than just continue to rely on the old map, if you go to the next page, Ron, uh, actually, I just have it cut. Okay. I don't have the next page. Yeah, that's a small, it's a bigger scale map and it, and it has uh, the actual, that's all right. I, I it's, don't it's have that. Mm, okay, sorry. I'd hold it up, but I don't think Zoom lends itself to that. <laughs> Try. I don't think it works. Uh, yeah, it never works. But it is in your existing book. And if you want to see the street okay. called out, you can just look. It's about three pages from the back of the purple book. Okay. Thank you. And we'll 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 have that up on the screen next time. For, okay, thank you. You bet. Um, I have another question mark from um, BFMMA, whatever that means. Oh, that's my email address. It's Brian Miller, 92 School Street. Okay. With Thank respect you. to the commercial vehicles parked in a residential area or on residential property, have we thought about that that allows refrigerated trucks to be parked on residential property and that that refrigerated truck very well may need to turn on its compressors in the middle of the night? I'm not sure about the size of refrigerated trucks, but the maximum is 14,000 GVW. That's like a small right, box truck. Yeah, it's a small box truck, but so are refrigerated trucks with respect to seafood in them. Okay, fair point. Um, I don't, well, are they allowed by, under federal law, to run their vehicle all night? It's not the vehicle, it's the compressor. Uh -huh. The compressor to keep things cold and refrigerated in the night. I get it. Well, that's a good point. Um, I'll make a note of that and we can certainly bring it up. I don't, you know. It... I'm sure there are many other types of situations like this that will produce a excessive noise possibly at night also for, for commercial vehicles to be parked in residential neighborhoods. Yeah, and I would note that many towns have um, chosen a smaller threshold than 14,000 feet, but um, your point is well taken and we'll put it on our agenda. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Um, Ann Harrison. Ann Harrison, 13 Tux Point Road. Uh, the question on home occupation. Um, I would like to see that inclusion of software development and other um, software and IT related professions being run out of the home. It certainly uh, is uh, being done, so we should no, no doubt add it. I think 65% of people work out of their homes, including me. I don't have clients come to the house, but I'm working out of my house right now, so. I think um, that needs to be broadened a lot. 
Yeah, I, I, I had suggested something that I think is a little bit ahead of its time in your community, which is pretty simple and straightforward uh, that I use routinely in towns up the demographic food chain. And that is that a home occupation, which involves no uh, client, customer, pupil, or employee coming to the house can be done as of right, no matter what it is, a lawyer, a doctor, a photographer, a, a tech person. If, however, it has any of those things, a client, a customer, a pupil, or an employee, then it requires a special permit. And it's more designed for a town where people bump into each other more frequently. Uh, we opted to go for your existing home occupation provision with a little bit of lipstick, uh, but I think it could use some more lipstick. And we'll, if, if the board isn't gonna go for my option, then I think we can add a number of different things there that are traditional now as home occupations. Thank you very much. Am, am, am I sharing my screen? I kind of got lost here. Yeah, you're good. And that's right where you should be. Can we move on okay. to section four? Yes, I believe we've answered all the questions. Okay, I'm gonna let me just make a note to myself about that. Okay, section four is dimensional regulations. Um, as I said, we did not change. This comes with its own table, table two, which is going to be since it's a portrait uh, table, I can put that easily into the final draft. Um, there are very few changes to section four. There's, uh, uh, there's some strikeouts. Let's just focus on that. Uh, the strikeout, uh, which used to be 5.8 special exception, um, is this is a state law provision and it you don't have it exactly quoted the way it's supposed to be stated. Um, for example, it's 5,000 square feet, um, 50 feet of frontage, not held in common ownership and um, then or now. So this is something that should just default to the statute, which has a body of case law associated with it, always with the wording uniformly that of the statute. When you go inventing these provisions, you get into rough water because it's not exactly what the statute says and a judge is gonna have a tough time construing it. And I don't think you intended any, if I thought you intended something more liberal than the statute, I would have uh, not been so bold as to delete it. But I think you intend what the statute says. The statute is General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 6, Paragraph 4, Sentence 1. And that's not what it says. You're not, you're not right on the, on, the, on the ticket there. Uh, if you go up a little bit, Ron, let me just see what else you've got there. Uh, yeah, so we added coverage requirements to Table 2. They were more or less just narrative. Keep going down. There's an accessory structure and a limited commercial, uh, the accessory structures, limited commercial district. It, these, are, these are crossed out, not because we deleted them, because they've been added to the dimensional table. And then there's a provision on accessory structures, which we worked out with uh, Paul Orlando, your building commissioner. You can go down around. Uh, special requirements that again, we worked out based on uh, the building department's experience. And I think that's it. A couple of things on prohibited accessory structures. One more page, Ron. And that's membrane storage units and steel storage pods for more than six months, both of them. Again, we did not change basic lot sizes in the dimensional requirements. We didn't change anything with regard to frontage or lot width or setbacks, side, rear, front, lot cover requirements and impervious surface requirements. We didn't, we didn't change any of that. Uh, looks like we have a question from Elaine Quinn. Hi, actually it's John Quinn, Walker Road. Good evening. Okay, John, sorry. No, no worries. I'm using her phone. <laughs> uh, okay. I just jumped in and I'm not sure if you touched on this or not, but I was just wondering about um, the occupancy limit on, say, a sober home in a residential area that's in, I believe, zone A, whether that is okay or is that been addressed? 
No, we didn't. Uh, I don't think we had any conversations about that. I'm mindful of the fact that if the sober home is nonprofit and it provides counseling, then it's likely to be protected under the Dover Amendment because there are cases from around the Commonwealth and in fact, in which that was ruled by the court. So there's different models for sober homes. Some are simply a space for recovering drug and alcohol abusers to rent without the counseling and without any sort of other nonprofit status, many are for-profit. Um, I don't know, I, I did represent the town of Wenham uh, when they had uh, recent difficulties within the last four or five years uh, with regard to a, a recovery center, not a, not a sober house, strictly speaking. And we did add something uh, in the back, which we'll get to much later. I believe it's section 11.7 or eight on reasonable accommodations. That's a provision that allows for an applicant to go before the board of appeals and ask for a, a reasonable accommodation under the ambit of federal disability law. So if they qualify under the ADA or the Fair Housing Act amendments uh, from the 1980s, then they would be able to establish their facility uh, by seeking a reasonable accommodation, both uh, with regard to the number of residents and with regard to the dimensional requirements uh, and other limits that are imposed by the zoning. It's a very powerful tool. So we put something in there to make sure that it was handled properly because sometimes it'll surprise a small town. Uh, and if they're, if they're surprised, it can lead to some dire consequences. Okay, so do you have a handle on where they are right now or what their proposal is or their, their business model? Nope, nobody mentioned it during the course of the meeting. Okay, thank you. You bet. I'll make a note though, something we probably should talk about. Okay, so um, non-conforming uses and structures is entirely yellow because your old regulations uh, uh, sort of were um, a little bit antiquated. Lots has changed in the last mm, 20, 20, 30 years with regard to the subject. So I'll give you the 101 primer as we walk through. Just stay right where you are, Ron. That's the statute you're looking at right there. The bylaw shall not apply to structures lawfully in existence or lawfully to begun or to a building permit issued before the first publication of notice of the public hearing, uh, which means essentially that with the advertisement of this ordinance, a uh, bylaw rather, uh, for the public hearing for the planning board, if you don't have your building permit or your special permit, you have to comply with the new rules, assuming there is a new rule. Uh, and there are ways for you to vest that but this is one of the ways to vest. Get the building permit, get the special permit before the ad appears in the newspaper. If you did beat it, 5.1.1, then under the statute, again, this is right from the statute, uh, you have 12 months to commence construction. It used to be six until August of 2016, now it's 12. And if you don't start, you have to play by the new rules. So these first two things are right out of the statute. Essentially what it says is that you have to tolerate non-conforming uses and structures as they were on the day they became non-conforming. You can't, you, you could compensate them and make them go away, but nobody does that because it would be way too expensive. So you have a policy decision to make. Do we tolerate them only as they were, or do we allow them to change? And the next two sections, non-conforming uses and non-conforming structures, basically allow them to change. Everybody allows them to change. I, I remember when I had a house in Beverly, Many years ago, I lived right at the corner of 126 as it comes into Dane Street. And there was a market there, JJ's Whistle Stop. And I watched that thing go through seven permutations in the four years I lived there. They went from not having alcohol to selling alcohol, from having no a dry cleaning pickup spot to having nothing. So these things need to change in order to stay in business. That's the moral of the story. So the changes need to be spelled out. What can you do to change? Now, we're not talking about a house. We're talking about JJ's. We're talking about an office building, but non-conforming single and two family houses have their own set of rules under the statute. So these things, non-conforming uses, are uses that were allowed and then the zoning change to make them either prohibited or requiring a special permit and they don't have a special permit. 
and the permissible changes would be to change or extend the use. And there's 60 cases that talk about where that line is drawn. And the other is change from one non-conforming use to another less detrimental non-conforming use. Um, and that is essentially a, 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 a policy option for the ZBA to make when they're presented with a truly awful non-conforming use that's going to be made better uh, because somebody has a better idea. And if the board uh, thinks that it is in fact a better idea, they can grant a special permit for it. The same policy choices face you at, under non-conforming structures. Uh, as you scroll down just a little tiny bit, Ron, thank you, one more. So the, the first permissible change is extension. Uh, I'll keep going down. Uh, extension, structural change or reconstruction and altered to provide for a substantially different purpose. Those are both mentioned in the statute. So we're not making up anything there. Section 5.4 is a situation where a variance is required and it's with regard to non-conforming structures. A variance is required where the alterations to the structure are going to result in a new non-conformity or an exacerbation of an existing non-conformity. And again, this, this is only talking about office buildings and grocery stores and lemonade stands. It's not talking about houses. And that is a basic, uh, that's a recodification, that is a codification of the holding in Rockwood versus Snow Incorp, uh, SJC case from the 90s. And then below is where the bylaw touches most people. And I mean that uh, with regard to each and every provision. So most people uh, in a small town meet the bylaw when they want to uh, alter their non-conforming single family home. And what we've said here is that you can do this uh, as of right. The, the, the statute says that if you're going to increase the non-conforming nature of the building, you have to get a special permit. Well, what the heck does that mean? Uh, there were cases back in the late 90s, early 00s, where the court simplified this drastically. And so what I've done is put in 5.5.1 as permissible changes. These are carve outs. Remember that the key question is, does it increase the non-conforming nature of the single family structure? Those are the statutory words. So these are just common sense. If you're altering a structure, which is located on a lot with deficient area, it's the structure that's non-conforming, not the lot. And your proposed alteration complies front, rear, side, and height. Here's a building permit. You don't need a special permit. Same thing with a lot which is deficient with regard to frontage. That's number two. But your proposed alteration complies front, rear, back, and height. And then encroachment number three, your building is in one side yard, but your alteration is in the other side yard, and it will comply front, rear, side, and back. And then if you look just at the top of where runs scrolled, stop right there, Ron, you'll see 100%. If the building is, even if the building complies with one, two, and three, but it's going to be more than 100% increase in uh, gross floor area, you still need a special permit because that's just a little bit too big to guess with. And uh, those provisions uh, are basically... I think would, will help your ZBA make decisions or, or, or your building commissioner make decisions that don't really need to go to the ZBA because if the alteration is complying in every one of those three cases and you're not doubling the size of the house, uh, the odds are you're gonna get the special permit in 99 out of 100 cases anyway. If you go down a little bit to abandonment or non-use, <clears throat> the statute says that if you abandon or don't use the, the non-conformity for a period of two years, um, it's gone. Um, I think we're going to have to go back to two. That's a typo. Um, I, it, that is not a provision that changed. So uh, I'll make a note to that effect. Um, it, says th you, it says three years. <laughs> it does. And that's a typo. Okay. So um, what I've also added, though, which is not in the statute, is that if it's, uh, for, if it's something that's been not used, which is the more objective standard for two years, but they want to bring it back, well, um, ask the ZBA for a special permit, and if they will give it to you, it's reinstated. I have a situation right now in the town of Maynard where my client has a digital credit union bank building, and on the same lot from many years ago, I think the house dates back to the 1930s, it, there's a single-family home. It's not an allowed use in the district, and the structure is non-conforming as well. 
it's fallen down. It's probably 10 years not used, but we're gonna go back to the Maynard CBA and ask them under this provision, which I wrote in Maynard as well, whether we can bring it back. Otherwise we gotta tear it down and it's gonna be a lost uh, dwelling unit for somebody lucky enough in town to get it. And then there's lastly some important procedures with regard to catastrophe and more importantly, voluntary demo. So the bottom line here is that if you're gonna knock down your, your structure, whether it's a single um, or a two family dwelling, uh, you can uh, rebuild it as of right on the same footprint in the same gross floor area. If you're changing either one of those two things, you need a special permit. And then lastly, there's a couple of housekeeping provisions at the end. Uh, not, if you've changed it to, to a conforming structure or use, it can't go back. And substandard lots means that if you are going to trade land with your neighbor, but you're not creating a greater nonconformity, you don't need to go through a variance procedure. And lastly, eminent domain, if the government reaches out and takes a piece of your lot, you know, instead of being non-compliant, we made you non-conforming by a dictative town meeting here. But these are pretty common things to help people not make mistakes. This is, um, I think, um, in about 65 or 70 towns at this point since I started figuring this out. It takes you 20 years to figure out section six of the statute. It's called the black hole of the statute. So it's, I don't get phone calls, which tells me that it's working. And um, I think it'll be an easier system for the building commission, uh, commissioner and the ZBA to implement. Happy Tom, to this is Christine. I actually have a question. I thought we were gonna stop at section five. Go ahead. Um, so. <laughs> A few years ago, a bylaw change came in front of town meeting and it's very similar to the wording that's being presented in section five. Could you explain to the public how this is different than that? I don't know. I, I didn't measure it against the old thing that was proposed. I'm happy to look at the old thing and let you know, but I'm not, I didn't, you know, I, I viewed this as being a standalone proposition rather than a comparison to something that was from a few years ago. Well, I think if it was defeated at town meeting, I think the public should be aware of how it's similar or different. Well, if somebody would be happy enough to point me the old warrant article, I'd be happy to be prepared to do that. Okay, I have a couple of hands raised. Um, it looks like um, I, uh, uh, Michael Sullivan has yet to speak. Uh, I would call on him first. I, I had a, a similar uh, thought that the non-conforming use language and Mr. Robrowski, I think this is in connection with that old Bjorkland case from the Supreme Judicial Court. There, there's been a lot of heavy debate here in the town over a number of recent years culminating in town meeting voting down a change along these lines. In fact, I think the change may have been even more conservative than this one. So I just wanted to, I was curious to know what the rationale was for, I think basically negating the result of that Bjorkland finding. Well, I can explain that pretty simply. Um, if you'll recall, just before Bjorkland, there was Bransford, uh, the Edgartown case in which the SJC had a tie vote uh, I think somebody had a house in Edgartown and they didn't want to reach the merits. And then Bjorkland came quickly on the heels of that. But the end result from Bjorkland and Bransford was that everything that involved alteration to single or two family homes had to go to the ZBA for a two part determination. Number one, did it increase the non conforming nature of the structure? And if the answer was no, you'll recall the case law said that they were entitled to the issuance of a special permit. And I wrote in my book around that time that that was nonsense because no one is entitled to the issuance of a special permit. The nature of a special permit is a jump ball. It's discretionary. And in one of the cases that followed that, I believe either the appeals court or the SJC acknowledged my comment and said that it was, you're, I was right. It was not appropriate to say that a special permit was entitled an entitlement. And at that point in time, I had, I think I had just done Sudbury zoning and Sudbury did have these carve outs. They had more carve outs. I think they had five. I didn't like the other two. 
And so I kept three of them. And I approached Justice Cordy, with whom I used to teach, and he was the strict construction guy on the Supreme Judicial Court. He looked to the non-conforming nature of the structure in the following way. He said, let's identify how it's non-conforming and did that get worse? And Justice Graney on the other hand said, and this was the two voices speaking in the Thai Bransford decision, Graney said, just squint. And if it looks like it's increasing the non-conforming nature of the structure, send it over for a special permit. And I asked them both. I said, do these carve outs work? I, I, are you okay with a town defining what in 99.9% .9 of all cases would easily satisfy the two part test and result in either uh, an entitlement to a special permit or an actual special permit on the merits to go to the second part of the Bransford Bjorklund test. And they both said, you have our blessing. And so that's, you know, I, I taught with Justice Cordy. I, I haven't seen Justice Cordy in quite a while, but probably up until about 2005, he and I taught at the same law school. And that's just made it into the work product here that I've, that I've generated. And as I said, nobody's, um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is right for everywhere, but um, it may not be for Manchester by the sea, but it hasn't, I don't get phone calls about it. I think the exercise could be proven if you were to look at every ZBA case in which there was a vote to grant a special permit because either it didn't increase the non-conforming nature of the structure or it was okay to increase the non-conforming nature of the structure. It would, be, it would be housed within the parameters that I embedded in section 5.5. Has there been any discussion of, as a practical matter, what a change like this um, would have as, as an inevitable result in terms of whether there would be more or less or the same amount of expansion of existing structures around town? Well, the, 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 the criteria of 551 are pretty tight. I mean, if, if your lot's too small, then your structure is by definition non-conforming. If your lot's got deficient frontage, your structure is by definition non-conforming. And if you're in a side yard, your structure is by definition non-conforming. So what happens next? You're proposing an alteration, but it complies. It's not like it's creeping out uh, into a side yard where it didn't exist before. It's compliant with side rear front. It's compliant with height. And the same thing is true in each of those three instances. So uh, it may even promote more sensitive proposals uh, because you know that if you don't go into a side yard, uh, then you don't need a special permit or a variance in the worst case. And if you don't increase it by more than 100%, the same thing would be true there as well. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, who hasn't spoken yet, as Bill Cross has his hand up. Um, Bill, do you have a question? Thank you very much, uh, Bill Cross, 31 Smith Point Road. So I, I've got what may be an unfair question for you, Mr. Bobrowski. This is a pretty small town. The building inspector is very much a, a part-time uh, member of the, of the town staff. And enforcement has not been the strongest characteristic of, of the town. Um, so can you just help us understand, and I apologize for the, the canine uh, vocal compliment here, if you, if the, <laughs> if he starts singing. Um, but can you just help explain how these changes would impact a town with limited hours for a building inspector and a historic uh, Achilles heel in enforcement? I mean, does this lead to an easier job? in uh, the town um, handling um, these rules or a harder job? And what would you counsel as ways for us to, as a town, have you know, more engagement with the rules and adherence to them? Um, thank you for your question. I, I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm talking uh, on the basis of my experience with 
I haven't done an exact count, but it has to be 65 or 70 towns that I've done most recently in my 35 year career that pretty much all have some uh, variation on this theme. I just, for example, I was on my Concord planning board and we're the queen of teardowns and uh, alterations of non-conforming single and two family structures. People here buy houses for in the sixes and they knock them down to rebuild them. So these rules, which I wrote for my planning board when I was on my planning board have been in effect here. I've been off the planning board for 10 years and I served a five year term. They know where to reach me. So I'm not getting pushback from either the building department or the zoning board of appeals. Um, I think that if, for that reason, I think that it does simplify the process because so much more can be done with a building permit than it can be with a special permit proceeding uh, that at least the ZBA's job is easier. Uh, and I think the building commissioner can make the calls there pretty, pretty straightforward. Either your proposed alteration complies front rear side coverage and height or it doesn't and if it doesn't you're not in one two and three and you need a special permit go to the zba so that that seems to take some of the decision making remember the test the test that you're asking mr orlando to implement without a carve out like one two and three is hey paul does that increase the non-conforming nature of the structure <laughs> that's a little bit existential isn't it you already had an argument between two Supreme Court justices about what that meant. So net net, it actually increases the, the degree to which you could reasonably expect the population of the town to abide by the rules. I, I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know what other, what people's plans are with regard to their, uh, their proposed alterations to their single family home. I know that in COVID, uh, people are staying put. And so maybe their alteration complies with one, two and or three, or they actually, actually, actually they have to comply with all three um, if it applies. And maybe they're staying under hundred percent, in which case here's your building permit. I, you know, what's the danger here? I don't see a danger if I'm not going to stick within the current setback yard building coverage and building height requirements, then I'm going to cause a violation that puts me into a at least a special permit visit to the Zoning Board of Appeals, if not a variance visit. There is a case from Chatham on Cape, uh, the Cape that says if I'm increasing, if I'm, if I'm in, there's a case from Brookline last year at the SJC that said if I'm just increasing an existing nonconformity on a house, I only need a special permit. And the other case is from Chatham a few years ago. It's an appeals court case. And it says, if I'm creating a new nonconformity at a house, I need a variance. And I don't, I don't particularly think that case was well decided, but I'm just me, so. Thank you. Hey, um, we got several, several hands up. So um, again, people who haven't spoken, I'm giving uh, preference to, and uh, Julie Crocker is next on the list uh it, it's actually andrew um and my Sorry. question is um how would you how, how would the new zoning code protect against a situation where you have a lot that is severely sufficient or deficient in area with a building that is very close to its lot lines on you know three or four sides and an applicant wanted to increase the volume of the building, I'd say it was a single story building, adding a second floor um, with the assumption that the lot and the structure were both um, detrimental to the neighborhood and they wanted to increase the volume of the building by 100%. Well, I, I don't use the term volume because that means cubic feet. I'm using GFA, which means square feet. And there are, there are differences. I've, I've actually had that play out. Um, and, you know, 100% isn't a magic number. It's, it's just, I mean, in Concord, if you look at Concord's provision, it's 50%. I think Winchester, when I rewrote their zoning, chose 25%, but it quickly became much too cumbersome and intrusive. And so they changed it. So it's, it's, there's nothing magic. I'm thinking it's a ranch 
I mean, th my thought at least was it's a ranch and you're putting a second floor on it. But that's not the right thing to do. Bjorklund, by the way, was a quintupling of the house size. And it could be done under one, two, and three. It fit one, two, and three, but it was a five times bigger house. And I, at that, when I read that, I said, there's got to be an upper limit on that before a public hearing gets, gets called. And the number I came up with just as a default was 100%. But we did talk about this at the committee meeting level. And if somebody wants to make a suggestion that 50% should be substituted, no, it's just, just a number as far as I'm concerned. Well, what, what are the, um, something that probably should be understood is whether a situation like that is likely to happen in, in the town of Manchester and whether there are in fact lots um, and properties that you know, are detrimental to the neighborhood that would need to be protected from something like that happening. Yeah, I think you know, I can't envision every weird case, but I can envision the vast majority of them. And again, my, if, if any of us had time, or even better, a research assistant to do this, you could go through the ZBA files in any town, and you could see what got approved and what got denied. And I'll bet that in the categories, five, 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 one, one, two, and three, if you were to do the research, 99% of those would have gone through. It, it wasn't worth having a special permit hearing for those because they all pretty much go through. Now, Justice Graney's comment is the one that rings out, right? Justice Graney said, just squint. You're adding something to something that shouldn't be there because it's non-conforming and therefore it increases the non-conforming nature. That, that's what throws it back to the 100%. Okay, if it's if it's five times as big, Bjorkland, I get it. If it's twice as big, I can probably live with it. If it's only fifty percent well, as big, that's a different thing altogether. I guess the concern is whether the existing property is already detrimental to the neighborhood, and whether you're increasing that detriment by a hundred percent. Well, if if it, it it it's it's got to be in one, two, and or three, depending upon what applies. But if it doesn't meet one, two, or three, then it's always going to a special permit, which, you know, and anybody is entitled to apply for a bad idea. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. I you bet. Um, a couple more questions, uh, Sarah. Am I on? Yes. Yeah, so I think the challenge is, is we have over 60% of the properties in Manchester, which are non-conforming. And do you expand the rights of non-conforming properties or do you adjust the zoning so that more of the properties are conforming and therefore you have a fewer number of properties applying for special permits. Well, that would mean in most towns, lowering the minimum area requirements and minimum frontage requirements. And I don't know many, I don't know many towns that wanna to do that. Well, but the challenge is, is Manchester has done a whole lot of overlay zoning, which makes no sense with respect to the existing properties. Okay, um, any comments? Um, Kurt? Hello, Kurt Svataka, 7 Bennett Street. I, I just have a question. The first thing that was stated, it's kind of more of a comment than anything, was that zoning anticipates bad behavior. That was the, the basis of the whole zoning bylaw. And um, and the previous uh, comment by someone was about the uh, enforcement with the building you know, the building inspectors part time and the enforcement is a big issue. So the, the question is kind of along the lines of if you open it up that just uh, things don't have to go to a board for approval. How do abutters get alerted that a building permit is being issued for something that they're not aware of. 
and, and you know, make a special yeah, permit to get alerted to that. That's a good question. Wellesley uh, has uh, taken it upon themselves to send out notice of building permits issued for new construction or substantial. I think it just applies to new construction, but it may apply to substantial renovation as well. And that's led to a whole line of cases, uh, the Gallivan line of cases, in which if you do receive notice that a building permit was issued, you have to appeal that within 30 days, which isn't a bad result because otherwise it's a six year statute of limitations to seek enforcement. Yeah, and, and that was gonna be my question and that I thought there was a small window to, uh, to question that permit. Yeah, it would be 30 days. If you know about it, it's 30 days. If you don't know about it, you have six years to seek enforcement. So many, many. I've, I've taken on behalf of private clients, for example, I had a private client in, we, in Weston who pulled the building permit. When we readjusted a, a, a flood uh, a prone, area, prone area, we got a, a letter of map adjustment from FEMA, uh, LOMA, as they're called, and we were right. That we weren't in the floodplain. And so we pulled the building permit and rather than risk six years of zoning enforcement, we sent a notice out privately to everybody saying we've got a building permit and you've got 30 days. If you don't file an appeal, your appeal rights will be gone. Nobody appealed. I, I guess my, my whole comment on this section is it, it appears as though it's making it things easier. And if it, the zoning is anticipating bad behavior, it's making easier to make bad behavior. Well, I, I would disagree with that only to the extent that I, I, I know that I'm going to get the bad behavior thing stuck on me, but zoning also has some noble objectives besides stopping bad behavior. But I, I, when I worked in a hardware store, they, they used to tell me when I sold a lock that locks kept honest people out. So let's just, you know, they, they also have some benefit. But I think what this is doing is making easy things easy because they are easy. I'm proposing an addition to my house. The lot's too small, but I'm my addition complies completely. So I don't see that as bad behavior. I, I, I view that as I view that as compliant behavior because my addition completely complies. Now, you know, the, the, I, the, I can hear Justice Graney, who I greatly admired in the distance, shouting, yes, but it's bigger. So I get that. Well, it it kind of goes to what, what Andrew Crocker said about some of the uh, technicalities of making something bigger mass-wise that may not, 100% square footage is a lot. Yeah, uh, I, I, like I, I'm not married to that. It could be smaller. Concord's 50. So that, those are the choices. Well, I think I think this has been a healthy discussion. It's been quite a while since I've raised my fond memories of Justice Graney and Justice Courtney. Um, but, and so duly noted, and we'll have this conversation with the board. I know that there are at least one or two members of the committee that want to revisit this issue because I've had a couple of emails already today. So duly noted as we, as we say. Okay. Um, Hi, this is um, Sandy Rogers, 82 Old Essex Road. Um, is this an and or or um, scenario? I'm just, I'm just trying to understand what this is actually saying, it's well, saying it's, that if you do not have sufficient area on your lot yeah. and you might not have enough frontage and you're already encroaching, then you can double the size of your structure. So what if, what if you're yeah, at no, the- as, as long as you're leaving out the punchline, as long as your proposed addition complies with all current setback yard building coverage and building height requirements. And so, it, it, it could be in a very strange scenario, one, two, and three, you're right. I think it would probably be one or two or three. Okay, so like recently there was a house that was going to be a teardown. It didn't have enough. It didn't have enough land, 
it was already at the limit of the height. It didn't have enough frontage, but you know, that's just grandfathered in. And it was allowed to go through. And there's so much of that that was already happening. So if you go back to sort of the history of what's been happening in the town is mm -hmm. there's been a lot of controversial building regarding that. So going for special permit was just sort of a nod, yet they weren't complying. So I guess, you know, it's just found foundationally what, where, where does that limit exist? If it doesn't exist in the zoning bylaw, then it like to what other people are saying, people are just going to take advantage of it. And then if they go to get special permit, they're just gonna get a nod anyway, unless there is sufficient notification to the abutters. So I guess I'm just trying to understand how much can a building be out of code and then double inside? You said your example was a tear down. Does that mean it was raised to the ground? It was torn down and they actually blasted more to you know, make more space on a non-conforming lot. Okay, well that would be a special permit because it was a non-conforming structure and they did not rebuild it in the same gross floor area on the same footprint. They made a bigger foundation and arguably a bigger house. So that's a special permit. Okay. I think um, clarity in this is important. And I just want to raise um, just the comment in agreement that doubling in size can have a huge impact on the neighborhood and the in, um, ability to notify abutters. I mean, I think what might happen is you'll have building started and constructing and people will then start demanding that changes be made after the fact. Um, I don't know if that's come up in scenarios like this. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I've definitely got a circle drawn around a hundred percent. So, um, you know, we'll, we, everybody should remember the alternative, which is left to nothing. If nothing changes and, and you're left case law at this point, the case law says that anyone changing their single family home, which is now non-conforming, must apply for a special permit. If the change does not increase the non-conforming nature of the structure, you are entitled to the special permit. If in fact it does increase the non-conforming nature of the structure, the board goes on to the second part of the test and actually decides whether the proposed addition will be more detrimental than the existing structure to the neighborhood. So it reaches the merits of your application. And what I've tried to do is eliminate the first part of the test, sending everybody to the board, some of whom may leave in five minutes with an entitlement to a special permit. That's what I've tried to do is predict who would be entitled to that special permit. If I missed it, you can always fall back to you know the case law. But that sends everybody to the ZBA. Let's go on to six, Ron. This gets a little easier at this point in terms of changes, I think. So uh, what I've tried to do is group together general regulations, which include um, parking signs, landscaping, and then something called performance standards, which uh, are intended to objectify site plan approval and special permit decision-making. You know, if, if the, something is subject to special permit or site plan approval, when it goes to the special permit granting authority, you know, they would look back here at the parking section and they'd go, aha, number of spaces, one per 300 square feet of gross floor area, and they would judge their decision uh, based upon that information. Same thing with signs. Your signs are too big, your signs are too small, your signs 
are just right. But there were no standards for landscaping and there were no standards for noise. There were no standards for lights. So what we tried to do was add uh, some of those just as a way of introduction here. So these are now, this is just the key. And if you go back to the use table and you look at the use, it'll have a one of the, one of the keys here, A through O. Uh, a lot of this has not changed in terms of location of parking, um, setbacks, plantings. Those are, these are provisions that are already in your bylaw. And um, I've added to parking a special permit provision. Um, and it basically says that if you have a better idea and particularly where your parking requirements are going to lead to an ocean of asphalt, which you don't need because you won't have that many customers or occupants, then come see us, tell us why. And by special permit, either the zoning board or the planning board, as the case may be, can grant a special permit to reduce the parking. Uh, or to waive any parking or loading requirement for that matter. The same thing is true with signs. If you scroll down, these are your existing regulations with regard to signs. I didn't change much, if any of them, go ahead. And you can see I've added a special permit. Again, I can't tell you the number of meetings I've sat through at a zoning board where somebody came in and said, I need a bigger sign or I need more signs because of soil conditions, shape, or topography. That's the criterion for a variance. You have to show a peculiar circumstance originating in soil conditions, shape, or topography. They're mentioned in the statute. Why do I need a bigger sign because of the soil conditions? I, need, I might need a bigger sign because I'm set back far from the street, but that's not a qualifier. So a variance isn't appropriate. A special permit can be used in this regard. Landscaping and screening is, um, something new. So we've got large parking areas. Um, if you keep going, run, there's some provisions with regard to fencing and retaining walls and berms. And, you know, we want everybody to put a, uh, some sort of a screen or a buffer around your HVAC equipment, your dumpsters, uh, exposed storage areas. And again, special permit. If you've got existing vegetation, for example, that separates your property from another then uh, you might not have to plant anything if you can talk us into it on a special permit. And then most importantly in section four is this last section on performance standards. It only applies to multifamily or non-residential uses. Uh, and multifamily I believe is triggered by five units or more. And then it runs through a series of performance standards beginning with uh, lights, keep going. Um, I keep going a little more. The first one is 644 lights. And then you'll see as you go through this, uh, noise is the next one. And then there are standards for site preparation and uh, development, just in terms of how much of the land to clear, uh, how to make sure that there's not, you know, the dust is under control, things of that sort. There's a series of uh, performance standards with regard to uh, traffic and pedestrian access. And it incorporates uh, standards for driveways and uh, curb cuts, interior circulation. What happens if you have a big proposal such that uh, a transportation plan is required, or when do you require a traffic impact access study, uh, which is the the uh, traffic transportation engineers' uh, chief you know chief contribution to these permitting decisions. Keep going, and there's also some wisdom with regard to. Uh, decreases in level of service and what would be tolerated, what wouldn't be. Mitigation can be required. The next one uh, talks about bicycle and pedestrian safety and also uh, equipment and apparatus. There are some standards for building design. Uh, 
uh, for utilities and for fiscal impact. So we, you know, the fiscal impact standards basically say, uh, if, it's, if this is a large proposal, you would wanna know what is your proposed gross tax revenue? What is your anticipated gross tax revenue? And then what on the other hand will costs be to the municipality? Um, I did years ago, I did a project in Leicester, small town west of Worcester that wanted to put in a, uh, a big box and they got one, they got Walmart. 220,000 square feet freestanding Walmart. They promised 175,000 in gross tax revenue, but when we crunch the numbers, they actually have 800 police calls at a Walmart that size per year. We found that out from the neighboring town, which had a similar size building. So not that you would say no because of that, but you would certainly want to know that in your decision-making process. And then there are some additional performance standards that are already in the LCD. So we just kind of rolled those over here to the back. Uh, then there are provisions for earth removal, which largely went unchanged. I'll go back up, Ron, because I want to call people attention to old section 16 topographical changes and land clearing special permit that, that was deleted and earth removal was basically intended to be a substitute for that. And I think there might be one more provision here in section six. Uh, we recommended moving stormwater to the general bylaws because it's important to uh, be able to address uh, leaks that are happening now, not just leaks that may happen in the future. And zoning is prospective in nature. So uh, generally I see stormwater as a general bylaw instead of a zoning bylaw. We'll stop there. There's a lot to, to read in the performance standards section. I, I invite everybody to take a really close look at it. We've talked about it a couple of times at the planning board level. I invited the planning board to treat it as a sushi menu, to, to take things that they liked and discard things that they didn't like. What you see is, is pretty much the original proposal. So I want everybody to be comfortable with it. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunity to comment on it before we go to public hearing. So, um, and it's a lot to read and comment on if you've just looked at it for the first time tonight, so. Uh, there's a question from Laura Tenney. Hi, thanks, Laura Tenney again, 86 Pine Street. Um, just a couple of themes I was wondering about. Um, one was I noticed you said remove stormwater in my, um, uh, purview of municipal um, zoning regulations, we're starting to see in landscape more performance-based landscape. So it's not only a focus on visual screening, but it also has has to do with um, performance-based landscape improvements for managing stormwater on site. Yes. So um, rather than treating it only as drainage in terms of a waste product, can we build into our zoning requirements some um, um, more discussion of uh, best practices for stormwater management on site? That was one comment. Yeah, I'm inheriting a stormwater bylaw that's already in the old book, and I was just going to move it over. I don't disagree with you that the trend is definitely to look at low impact development. Um, Southboro, for example, has a very recently adopted, very up to date uh, LID um, bylaw that I ha actually went through as a private applicant with a client. And well, there's a lot in there to like, and some that the client didn't like. But I, but I agree with you that there's an old an alternative approach to this. I don't know that it's. I don't know that it's in the scope of a recodification. And we. I mean, I feel like if we don't talk about it here, we're leaving a big gap in the development capacity of the town. And I, I'm concerned that if it's not even mentioned in the zoning, then you know people forget about it. And they don't go looking in the general bylaws. So I, I do feel like we're. You only update your zoning, what every couple of decades, and so um, I think getting smart about LID and um, you know, looking at some of these other models for best practices for stormwater management. So many of our water resources are really critical to our drinking water. Uh, we have a lot of steep slopes in town. So that would be my uh, pitch for that. Well, I'm certainly happy to, to take um, somebody's um, good advice in terms of what 
should or shouldn't be in the existing stormwater management bylaw. I would invite you to look in the existing bylaw online today, not mine, the old one, that's section 6.15. That's what we're proposing to move over. There are requirements, for example, um, under standards that there is use of BMPs, uh, best management practices, and it does refer to a stormwater management handbook or stormwater policy handbook. I assume that's the DEPs. Um, and there's a whole series of standards there, 11 or so in nature. That Laura, that, Laura uh, can you submit something that you had in mind? Yeah, that's my, that's my point. Uh, sure, I can take a look and, and offer something. I think that would be great. And then just quickly, th thank you for the um, conversation on that. On the um, head and bike safety, uh, just a comment about whether um, it's worth a mention of accessibility or MAAB, particularly when there is development that's impacting sidewalks. I've seen sidewalks um, being installed that you know don't meet the appropriate cross pitch for an ADA accessible walk, or maybe they don't meet the width. Obviously, there are you know MAAB governs that, but I just wonder um, how you might treat that in the zoning so that it's clear that those are requirements. Well, it comes in through Paul's office, and he's, uh, for better or for worse, in charge of that because it's something, uh, you know, it's connected to the state building code. Uh -huh. okay. So he would be the intake and enforcement officer for that. Okay, thank you. I'll submit something on um, stormwater. That'd be great. I appreciate it. Um, if I you might want to take a look at the Southboro bylaw. Uh, which I, I, I recently, uh, I think my experience is about a year, year and a half old, but boy, they, I think we were the first people to go through it and it was thorough. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll look for that. Okay. Um, I see Mary, you have your hand raised. Uh, is there something? Hi, Ron. Thank you. Yes. I wanted to ask about the earth removal bylaw. We didn't really vet this as a planning board and there were a couple changes with the requirements of um, the feet for to topography. It used to be five feet and the new bylaw is saying 10 feet. And then with the allowable um, removal of relocation of more than 250 cubic yards of earth and it used to be 100 yards and then 20 yards respectively. So I'm wondering um, what was the rationale behind those changes and what impacts will those have? And if, if I remember correctly, the earth removal bylaw was a, the product of a subcommittee and it came to, to me rather late in the game. It should be yellow uh, because it's not what was in your existing ordinance, your existing bylaw. So I don't, I don't. Could we put that on as a um, item for the planning board to review? I agree. Thank you. And Sue, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Ron. I just wanted to um, respond to Laura. Thank you for your comments on that. And um, you're right, usually um, bylaws are not um, changed very often, but this is our first chance. And um, we are planning to do carry on revisions of the things that we don't get to this time. And LID um, low impact development bylaw is one of those. So. Um, thanks for that, and we will keep um, trying to improve this <laughs> because we we certainly can't get everything this in this one time. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Sue. All right, Mark. It's eight ten. Um, oh, uh, we let's just let's go fast. Twenty minutes. I'd like to end at eight thirty and see where we are, and uh, great. Know, go from there. Some of this doesn't change much. So uh, wireless, uh, I don't think we changed much here, if I have anything. Uh, just keep scrolling and I'll shout it out as we go. Helicopter landing, I can guarantee I didn't change it. Junk cars is the second of three, stormwater being the first, that would go over to the general bylaws. Uh, marijuana is uh, what you've adopted as a town. Just, again, this is a chapter on special regulations, so this is kind of a potpourri, but that's, uh, these are things that have just been thrown together because they're not residential. Adult entertainment, 
Um, these are constitutional provisions up front here that are required under the First Amendment jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. And then there are a couple of things that talk about, these are statutory conditions, for example, in no instance will the board issue a special permit to any person violating those laws. You know, those are bad laws. You don't want those people. Common driveways, I think, is what you have already. We didn't change it. Uh, those are just, uh, I, oh, the, oh, the last of the three is driveways and curb cuts. So the, go, go back to the uh, previous one run. Stop right there. Go down a little bit. So the, there is a existing curb cut down a little more uh, bylaw that gives the planning board jurisdiction uh, with regard to curb cuts from the traveled portion of the way. That is not subject to zoning. And for that reason, most towns, most every town I've seen other than you with a curb cut regulation administers that through the board of selectmen, which are designated as road commissioners by statute. Uh, zoning, um, Judge Long recently had a couple of decisions in the land court, does not have jurisdiction over a roadway, a public roadway. So that's the third of three. To repeat, curb cuts, stormwater management, and junk cars would be the candidates to go to the general bylaws. Um, this should be yellow. Um, it, it's, it, this is a new provision on accessory dwelling units that was created by a committee late in the game to uh, revamp what you had already. Here's it's not hand. terribly different. Oh, here's my hand, raise my hand. But, it's, but it is, again, um, like the earth removal provision, uh, a latecomer. And there's the old one there. Uh, otherwise, in this section, we uh, go back a little bit. I want to make sure everybody understands that planned residential development, P, uh, our PRD, has been eliminated. Um, down again, Ron. Stop. So this bylaw uh, was not usable, really. I think it required, if I remember right, it was a 50 acre minimum. I don't, I don't think anybody had used it. Um, so we eliminated it and we instead, and we eliminated two other provisions of the bylaw that deal with the same topic, alternative residential development. By the way, this is in uh, the Governor Baker's hit I list. I skip of, over this ADU thing. I mean, the, this, we this had our can, hand up. We have our hands up. This could now be done on a 50% vote of town meeting. And eventually, Ron, is pretty long, so just go through all the strikeout. Okay, so now we have a revamped residential conservation cluster. This has got the best ideas from old uh, uh, PRD, which was 6.8, um, old RCC, which was 6.13, and then you had another provision called open space, which was old 6.7. And what we've done is keep the basic format of residential conservation cluster, but instead of requiring a special permit um, and, a, and a, in a subdivision, uh, anytime somebody proposes over, I don't remember, I think it was X, six lots, um, you, which you cannot do because of a case decided by the appeals court called Wall Street Development versus Planning Board of Westwood. We've made this voluntary under Chapter 40A, Section 9, but we've incorporated the flexibility that you liked in the old RCC. So this is truly a zero lot line alternative development style. If you don't want to put the lots on a lot, if you don't want to put the houses on a lot, you can have a condo style development. If you scroll down a little further, this is all by special permit from the Planning Board. Keep going. Uh, so the design process is basically stolen from your old RCC, but this is a hallmark of all alternative development style. If you see 8.2.6, you don't have to have a lot. You don't have to have the frontage requirement, but if you're on an existing street, not a new street created in the RCC, you have to have uh, reduced, you, you cannot have reduced frontage. 
Uh, there are provisions in here for density bonuses. They're somewhat tame, 20% of the maximum number that you would have otherwise. Go ahead. There's an affordable component that's mandatory. Uh, it's 10% of the number of units. If you look at types of buildings, you can have two family units. You can have single family anywhere. You can have two family in the RD1, RD2, two or three family in the G district. And roads uh, borrow their standards from the subdivision regulations. Uh, parking requires two parking spaces per dwelling unit. Open space is a minimum of 20% of the parcel. The open space ownership is also uh, prescriptive here. Keep going, Ron. That's, this is standard for alternative residential development. It, the open space is gonna go to a public entity or a, or a trust. Buffer areas to make the perimeter um, screened. If there's going to be lots, you have a homeowners association. If the houses or the dwelling units will be in a condo style, you need a condominium. And lastly, if it's a subdivision, you go through the subdivision control law, but not every one of these will be a subdivision. Some of them will be a condo. So there are plenty of examples of this. Um, two of the ones that I pointed out. May I raise Ron a point of order? We've gone right by the ADU section and several of us have had our hands up. Yeah, well, the, we were going through each section. We're in section eight. When we're done with Mark reading section eight, We'll have discussion on section eight. I thought I laid that out earlier. Okay, sorry, thank you. I, I thought you were zooming. We don't have much time, that's all. Go ahead, I'm no, sorry. No, if, if we need more time, we'll have another meeting. Um, you know, if there's a lot of questions on this ADU issue, we'll uh, have another meeting. But right now um, we have Mark and he's just going through section eight. Let's get through section eight and then we'll go for questions. The last thank part you. of section sorry. eight is a senior housing facility and um, it go down, yep. And this is a proposal that would allow for independent living, assisted living, long-term care and congregate care, uh, standing alone, any part of it or combined any part of it. Um, and it would allow for this um, on a, min a minimum lot size as otherwise required in the district. And the thinking here is that these are fine contributing tax generators within a community that have relatively few costs. And not to mention that there are 85 million people that are in the baby boom generation that are gonna need some place to go. I, I'm, we had a couple of proposals in Wenham, the old Penguin, Penguin Hall was proposed as an independent living facility and it seemed like it would be a good use of that property. And I think that's the end of eight, Ron. Okay. Um... I'll open uh, questions for uh, section eight, Sheila Hill, you're first. You can unmute yourself. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, yes. Mark. Uh, Sheila Hill, two Running Ridge Row. I just want to make sure I fully understand the changes uh, in this ADU section. And um, I thought I'd take you through a scenario as if I was going to try and build an accessory unit in my own, on my own property. Uh, and you can correct me if I have a misinterpretation. So the main thing that is new about this um, bylaw is that you have taken out uh, the um, 8.1.2 previous section requiring a special permit. So now that we have um, the before us, we have a bylaw that wants everyone in all the residence districts to have an ADU by right. And that, that may not apply to, it sounds like it doesn't apply to residents, the new residents D2, but it does apply to all the other districts in town. Is that correct? Uh, let me set the record straight. I did not write the new ADU bylaw. It was the product of a committee that uh, took the time and effort to do it. And as a result of the committee's decision making, it was substituted for the existing. Uh, it should be yellow, make no mistake about it. And um, you know, this is this is where the, the committee that was tasked with this came down. Mm -hmm. So, and who, and who was on that committee, Mr. Babowski? 
well, it was a residential. Um, perhaps Gary Gilbert can speak on that. Uh, what's the question? Your, your, Mark, Mark says that the, the, the ADU section was written by a committee, not, uh, not himself. And I wondered who's on the committee. Ron, there was a group of about eight people that spent about six months researching um, zoning bylaw changes in general to accommodate more um, residential units. And this rose to the top as the first thing to tackle. And there was consensus to propose a revision to the bylaw. The people on it were people like John Feuerbach, who's the chair of the Manchester Affordable Housing Trust, who's I think listening. Um, um, some architects, uh, a variety of people that have some experience in housing. Uh, George Davis, Matt Genta. There's a list of people, about eight people. Okay, well, I can get that list from you, Gary. Thank you. I would like to, to know that. Um, well, I'm the planning board voted on adopting the language that was recommended by this group. So at this point, it's the planning board that's supporting this and proposing this. And that list of people is not really uh, uh, relevant to considering the bylaw change. Well, you may not feel it's relevant. I may feel it's relevant, but thank you. I um, live in uh, resident single district A, just I believe zoned one acre. Uh, and I want to, I, let's say I'm going to um, build an accessory unit and the property to the left of me, which has a swimming pool is going to build an accessory unit and the property to the right of me, which has an outbuilding, a barn in the back, they're going to build an accessory unit as well. So there's a buffer of trees between the property on the left and their pool. But as I understand it, I can build, these are my, these happen to be trees on my property. I can tear down these trees and I can build an accessory unit on my lot line, 10 feet from their lot line, which happens to be their, their pool, so to speak. So are there any height restrictions for my accessory dwelling unit? I think as it's written, it would be the height limitation in the district, which in most, without looking at the height limitations, I think it's 35 feet. Okay, so I can build a 35 foot unit overlooking their pool. Are there any occupancy limits for my ADU? Well, you know, you're asking, uh, someone who received the, the news from a committee to answer no. questions. So I, it'd be more appropriate if you address them to the planning board as a whole. It's, no, well, it's, Sue, Sue uh, do you wanna represent the planning board as a whole? Or Ron, do you wanna represent the planning board as a whole? I wanna know how many people can live in this ADU. And do they have to be related? That is not one of the requirements. Mm -hmm. Ron, would you like I'm to- not Ron, you like how many people can live in this unit that's going to overlook my, my neighbor's pool? Ron, would you like to have a, a board member um, respond to that? Uh, yeah, I'll have a, Gary, can you respond to the uh, questions? Um, the text of the law is not very long. If you read through it, I think we tried to spell this out quite clearly. Um, it's limited to two bedrooms. The amount of people is not limited. Um, the idea of this law is to encourage the development of these as a, as a way of, um, of having some sort of diversified housing scattered throughout town instead of concentrated in one area. Um, the building has to be owner occupied. Um, the, uh, let's see. It's, it's not very uh, realistic to say someone would build a brand new structure in order to have a, a little rental apartment because you just won't get the revenue. We've, we projected it would cost at least $300,000 to build something like this. You won't see a, a new structure being built just for these. You'll see typically interior renovations and most people don't want them. There's no, most people don't want an apartment in their house. They wanna to go to their home and have it be just their home. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, at, I, I'm not, excuse me, Gary, I don't want a review of why you think this is a good idea. I'm, I have some very specific questions. That's, that's what I'd like to go through. 
Um, Ron, are there limits to questions here? Pardon me? Well, I, 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 go ahead. So I can have an unlimited number of people in my ADU. And since I have a, you know, I have a lot of acreage, um, I, I might be willing to spend four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars to build a nice piece of property. I mean, I mean, a nice dwelling. My neighbor on the right, uh, there's a, a group of trees that separates our properties, and but he's he's uh, the owner of those trees. He can cut them down and build. I assume he can build an ADU and connect it to his barn. Is that correct? Ron, am I supposed to continue answering? Um, well, where, um, what, what's the, um, if you can yeah, answer that question. Cut down trees on their property in town. Somebody can clear cut their whole property. That's the current lack of a law regulating how many trees you cut down. That's, that's the existing rights of property owners. I asked if he can connect an ADU to his barn. The provision says in section 8.1.2.7, that it is allowed in detached structures. Okay, then he could build an accessory dwelling unit attached to his barn, 35 feet high that overlooks my deck. Is that correct? Once he takes down the trees. Nobody could build anything that they're not currently allowed to build under current law. Um, and sometimes people can build on parts of their property that are close to a neighbor and a neighbor may not like it, but if they have the right to do it, they have the right to do it. Um, no, I'm talking about the new ADU law. I want to know, I don't want to know. I want to know if under the new question. proposed ADU law, this is how this would work. He would go to the building inspector does he have to bring a plan to the building inspector or does the building inspector make a site visit to my property or my abutters property? Well, it's going to need a building permit. So you'd have to go to the building inspector. With a plan. That's the way you get a building permit. Yeah, no, I'm, but the building inspector does make a site visit. Doesn't have to, but he mm -hmm. definitely has to go see the building inspector. Okay. Um, we, we want these, according to the bylaw to be, uh, the verbiage for older people. Are the, is that going to be regulated? Uh, is, are these ADUs going to be regulated as, 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 uh, restricted to a certain age group? No. And are they going to be in any way regulated with respect to affordability? No and no. No and no. Okay, so I guess I would ask a, a last philosophical question. How, how does this ADU bylaw advance the housing challenges we have in Manchester right now? Because I don't see that people are going to be able to build a $400,000, $500,000 accessory unit and rent it to to anyone uh, without having the rent be fairly high. I don't see it as an affordable uh, advantage. I do can see I, uh, an can, intensity um, problem <laughs> for can the I town. Ask, can I ask John Fraubach to uh, respond on that? I, I think he was part of the... Yeah, Ron, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ron, and, and thanks, uh, Mr. Bobrowski. Uh, John Poirabach, 5 Herald Street, uh, resident here, but also, as indicated, I'm involved with the Manchester Affordable Housing Trust. <coughs> I, I was part of the study group, and one thing I, I want to um, mention, and I don't think Mr. Bobrowski meant this in any uh, bad way, but he said it was sort of like a late-breaking group. We actually started our work, I think, in the fall of 2019. It was actually before the pandemic. We had a number of meetings and we had 
a couple meetings or certainly presentations at the planning board. So I just want to um, acknowledge that. Um, and then the second, I, I think it's talking uh, for the affordable housing trust, <clears throat> we don't see it as community affordable housing in that uh, you look at the provision and there's not a requirement that it does, has to have a deed restriction and it has to be affordable. We do see it as um, housing that will be affordable. And what we mean by that is that by it, it would increase choice for folks who are living in town to possibly um, rent an, an accessory unit. So we see it as an affirmative opportunity to increase the supply of relatively small, well-designed, within the character of the town uh, type of rental unit. And as the, the, the proposed bylaw indicates, yeah, there's some great advantages to that. One, it helps folks who might be strapped by income and gives them an opportunity to have rental income. It gives an opportunity for people to stay um, you know, with, within families intergenerationally. Uh, so I think there's some benefits to that. If you look at the bylaw, um, um, we spent a lot of time looking at studies so that we had strong design guidelines, we had strong occup occupancy provisions, we had uh, provisions relative to parking. <clears throat> and last, I, I think there's some question about what is the impact of ADU on property values. Um, and the work that I've done when you look at the increase of rental income, you look at the value of additional square footage over time, and there's different types of square footage you can add to a unit. You can add usable rental space, or you can just add a basic expansion. Uh, the increased um, value of the square footage when it's relative to rental income, it increases the value of that, of that unit. So, the impact is increased assessed value and increases the, the, the value of the home. And so I guess the lesson I've taken from this is in order for the ADU to have value and be important to the town, you got to have strong standards. And I think when you look at the, the, the new language, there are some very, very clear standard, standards that um, emphasize a strong design and whatnot. Uh, and then the other thing is that I, I think we'd be fools not to promote um, ADUs because all you got to do is spend, spend a moment and just Google accessory dwellings and property values. Uh, you don't have to do it now, but just make a note, accessory dwellings and property values. And Sue Brown has my contact information. I, I would like to talk to you if you can find a case where there is really any situation where there is any negative value. You might see a downside to an ADU if it fails to meet a standard, if it's done poorly or, or uh, like haphazardly, in which case it will negatively impact value. But most of the case studies and the scholarship, scholarly research shows that um, property values will be increased by the ADUs. And lastly, we're not talking about something that's quite dramatic. We're only talking about a couple units uh, per year. So there you have it for me, Ron. Thank you. Um, so it's 835, there's several hands raised. Um, I'd like to get through the hands raised and then I think we're gonna quit for the night. And uh, so hopefully you can keep your uh, comments or questions brief um, and then we'll uh, uh, go back to the board and try to schedule and, and finish up these. So the first one I have is Connie, had your hand up. I did, Connie Sullivan. This is a um, Hi, Connie. <laughs> planning Board and the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, yes. Going back to section 811, um, under purpose number five, it says that one of the purposes is the primary residence be owner occupied. Yeah. Go down to 1.3. And it says the procedure, there should be an affidavit that one of the units in a building be occupied by the, by the owner six months of the year. So my question, you need to define what it means to be owner occupied. 
That's number one. Number two, you probably need to strengthen the BRBO bylaw because it opens the door for investment people to come in and live here a maximum of six months and rent both up properties out for the rest of the time. And the third comment I would make as having been on the Affordable Housing Trust is that originally a number of years ago when people started talking about ADUs, one of the thoughts was that older people could move out of the large house mm -hmm. into an ADU because they don't need the big house and rent the what is now considered primary residence, the larger residence. I don't see that reflected here at all. Maybe that could be an option put in for, you know, seniors or disabled people or whatever. But I think that would help the affordability issue. But I do think that a little more work on the language needs to be done. And I think we really need to prevent investors coming in here and buying and renting out on VRBO for you know many many months on both the houses so that's it thank you connie um i phone up brenda furlong is next this is another friend of mine. thank you very much uh brenda thank furlong you. 19 ocean street my question is really to the uh planning board in the documents uh outlining the adus there are two criteria specified. One is a setback requirement and the other one is a lot coverage requirement. My question is, in all of your analysis, and I don't know how many um, actual plots there are in town, there's probably 2000 or 2500, but in your analysis in looking at this opportunity for ADUs, how many potential ADUs do you think could be built in this town and conform with the setback and the lot coverage requirement? And would you share that analysis? I don't think we've done, Sue, have, uh, has that been done? There's not, so there's 2,500 units, I guess potentially, 2,500 people could, but the, the large volume of history and studies shows that that will not and does not occur. Most, um, most communities that have put in this type of regulations have seen several to a dozen um, in those units in the first year, and then they fall back after that. So I know people want to think that maybe, or are fearful that there will be a large influx of this type of housing and that it will change the character. But the, the history of ADUs, which have been on forever and the many, many studies out there um, just do not back that up. Um, I'm not asking about trends and, uh, and activities. I'm really asking about how many potentially could be built. And I would say that my question stems from the fact that I drove down Bridge Street today and I happened to look across all of those massive lawns and I could see an ADU at every single one of them. Uh, here on Ocean Street, we already have a number of them. There's one under construction and there's this, uh, another one that has been approved. So I'm not asking about trends. I'm not asking about what else has happened. I'm asking about, given the fact that you've set two criteria, setback and lot coverage requirements. What is the potential universe, five years, 50 years, forever, of ADUs given those two constraints? In all due respect, I said there were about 2,500 units, so that would be the universe of potential. So all 2,500 plots and lots and land would allow for setback and lot coverage requirements? I doubt that's the case because 
there are a number of small lots and a number of, of lots that wouldn't have the ability to, to, uh, to orchestrate the setback and the coverage requirements. So I'm just, I'm, I'm curious because I think that would be a very fundamental part of the analysis to be done and to be presented to the, uh, to the voters. You know, we think the universe would be only a hundred, it would be a thousand, it would be 575, but it seems to be a very fundamental component of the analysis before asking the voters to uh, vote on this. Okay. Ron, can I make a brief comment? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Gilman. Um, ADUs are not really thought of as something you build per se. It's generally by far, if you look at studies that have been done on them, these are not like generally new construction apartments. These are generally interior renovations. Sometimes there's a bump out or, or whatever, a room or something, but current, current property owners can, can't do anything more than they're currently allowed to do anyhow in terms of expanding their house. But generally they're interior renovations. And as I said before, most people really are not gonna prefer them. I wouldn't want one myself, but um, most people want a single family home only. But uh, generally they're interior renovations. Sometimes there's some bump outs. And uh, Mr. That, Mr. Gilbert. They were, um, they, they, that's sort of the way reality is. Um, I know we could imagine scenarios maybe that are scary, but that's just not how it really works out. Well, um, you live in near to my neighborhood and uh, across the street from me at 20 Ocean Street is an ADU going up that's new construction. So I just wanted to understand what the potential number of these would be. And I know it's very theoretical, but given the setback and get, given the lot coverage requirements, how many possibly could be constructed in this town? But I gather you don't have an answer. So, um, okay. Um, I have uh, two more. Uh, Mary Foley, do you have a question? Hi, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, this is Mary Foley. Um, I wanted to for first clarify that um, not all board members, planning board members, have um, backed this ADU proposed bylaw. It first came to the board and it was voted down. It then was brought, brought back to the board with new board members and it was voted in. Um, I have been pushing that we need to do our due diligence and get this data that residents are asking for. Um, to date, we have done no data analysis fact finding for Manchester. Uh, we need to understand who applies for these types of permits, who lives in them, where in town would they go, how many cars come with them, what would the rents be, all this basic factual information that can then inform the policy. Let's get actual field data instead of planning assumptions or what's happened in California or Needham or other towns. We need to understand what is good for Manchester. We need that analysis how this would impact current housing, density, neighborhood character, schools, infrastructure, public services, schools, taxes. These ADUs are infill developments that will have potential impact to neighborhoods. If the response is that we won't see any separate buildings built, then that should be removed from the bylaw and we should keep it as it currently is that it's within the structure and within the footprint of a current single family home. So I just wanted to make it clear that, that I agree that we need more data on this. Um, thank you, Sandy. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to back what Mary just said. I, that was part of my question was the whole financial impact of the population um, and what that would mean because um, we're looking at a large, um, you know, large density rental situation and that these people might be going to schools, et cetera. Um, I, my question is, um, or statement is, there's a lot of assumptions being made. And I thought that the idea of putting together a set of rules and regulations is so that it's clear versus this ambiguous nature of, well, most of them are attached, they may not be, um, but it looks like 
you can build a separate unit, but you're not allowed to have a front entrance to that separate unit because of the way that this has been put together with some information on assumptions that it's going to be an attached situation where you would go in through a side entrance versus a separate building, but you can't have something on the facade. So it looks like a lot of work needs to still be done for that kind of clarity. Um, and then the other thing is all of the issues regarding understanding the parking scenario and what that would mean. Um, are people then allowed to put in separate driveways? Um, what does that do to uh, you know, the, the curb cuts and all those other things that need to be determined. So there's a lot of questions and um, it looks like we need to work this out more so that we can ask the questions legitimately versus in these general way. It's, it's very difficult to understand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think I've gotten through all of everybody with their hand up. Have I missed anyone? Uh, Laura, did you? have a comment? I didn't get to you. Or you just left it over from before. Looks like. All right. No, no, no more comment. Okay. So I'd like to um, thank everybody for participating tonight. We've got some good discussion. I think we've gotten through eight, Mark. So uh, we're pretty far along. Um, yeah, nine is the uh, is the special district, so it's uh, aquifer protection, floodplain, uh, and ten is energy, which we didn't change. So the most important remaining provisions would be Chapter Eleven, which is procedural uh, and administrative, and then okay. Section Twelve is the uh, is the definitions. Okay, so maybe we can do that in a in a shorter meeting in the near future. But we'll work to get a schedule together, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, it's late, we've uh, gone way over and um, I'd like to ask the uh, board for an adjournment, motion to adjourn. So moved, Gary Russell. Okay, uh, Okay. roll call, Mr. Coons, who's not on, right? Uh, Mr. Licio. It looks yes. like some more people have questions that haven't asked before. I thought we were, I got through everyone. Who, who uh, am I missing? Like uh, Axel and Sylvia um, had their hand up maybe just before the call for adjournment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yes. I point out that there's a lot Mashkinoma. more, uh, 52 Masconomo Street. Uh, I'd like to point out that there's a lot more to section eight than the accessory dwelling unit um, to discuss. I think a lot of it pertains to uh, what's uh, under discussion for the 40R uh, uh, proposal. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to say that um, the request for further analysis of this is striking me as not recognizing what the constraints are on individuals wanting to, to build a separate unit uh, for an accessory dwelling unit. I, I understand the, um, the, the, the fear that some people have that everybody's gonna build a second dwelling on every lot in Manchester but it's highly unlikely given the cost of construction, given the, the existing uh, restrictions on what you can do and can't do. And this is designed to enable people to uh, use their, uh, largely designed to uh, allow people to use their existing houses to, uh, uh, rent out largely smaller units than what exists in Manchester for um, uh, some small revenue and therefore increases the, 
um, the uh, availability of smaller housing units. Anyway, so my major point is that there's a lot more in, in this whole uh, section to be examined in the next section. Thank you. Well, uh, Mark, maybe we'll start with, with eight, if there's any pieces that need to be picked up next time. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, we're in the middle of a motion to adjourn and I've gotten a, uh, a motion made and seconded and I've got Ms. Delicio in favor, Ms. Foley, yes. Ms. Yes. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Olney. Yes. Mr. Russell. Yes. And chair votes yes. So thank you all for coming. Stay tuned for our next one. We're adjourned. Thanks everyone. Thank you.